Hello, and welcome to the Crate and Crowbar. This is episode 80. It's the 17th of February. I'm Tom Francis, and here with me today are... Marsh Davis, hello. And... Tom Senior. And Tom, you just got back from Paradox Con. Paradox Con. A place where nothing makes any sense. No, apart from uh, it's full of wizards and uh, <laughs> people doing strategy at each other in turns. Oh. Continuous, uh, or continuous strategy with pause functions. <laughs> That's what they like. That sounds so debauched. That's their thing. It was, it was, it was pretty hot, oh, I must admit. <laughs> uh, we were in a convert, the hotel place where, where the entire event took place it was a converted prison. Hmm. So uh, our rooms were all old cells that had been converted into oh, wow. little bunks, and then uh, we were kind of ushered out every day at uh, nine AM to play uh, extremely obtuse strategy games, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, was fucking amazing. That's all I wanted to do ever. So uh, it was pretty happy. <laughs> where are they based? Sorry, did you say uh, Stockholm. Oh, right. That's which is where Paradox are actually their main offices are based, mm. including Paradox South and Paradox North. Paradox South is named so because it's in the south of their big office building. Paradox North <laughs> is named so because it's above Paradox South physically. <laughs> <laughs> On the floor above. It's it. Galactic North. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Galactic North. <laughs> um, but it was actually, they showed off, uh, they announced nothing new. Which was amusing because they said the theme of the conference was transparency. And someone asked, <laughs> "What are you working on?" They said, "We can't talk about that." <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, which is which well, the paradox. <laughs> living up to their name, definitely. Uh, <laughs> but it did mean I got to play uh, some uh, juicy things uh, that I'm going to be careful about what I talk about. Cause some of it is embargoed. I can't remember, but I can talk about City Skylines. It's embargoed, but oh yeah. Today. I heard someone say that that was the game that SimCity should have been. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's desperately what they want you to think about it, because the UI... <laughs> Maybe it was a marketing is... person for SimCity. <laughs> yeah. Is that in the same Skylines. series as the other Cities games? Like, I think it's Cities in Motion is another one? I think or so. Cities the, XL? So the devs from Motion are working on this. Ah, right. Okay. It's not the same series, it's kind of basically just, a, you know, they've gone in from scratch mm. to... Um, and it, it looks exactly like SimCity in terms of the in- user interface in that, you know, if you, if you place a, a building that makes people happy, you'll get that amazing shockwave of happy faces spreading yeah. across your city. They, they've, they've just lifted all that stuff directly, which is fine because it works really, really well. And the best <laughs> thing about SimCity was the fucking interface, which is just beautiful. Um, the, the good thing about this is that it, it, it kind of works, <laughs> uh, uh, as opposed to SimCity, which kind of, uh, had its flaws that kind of became suddenly painfully apparent after about nine or ten hours of playing it, and until that point, it's like really fun. Uh, SimCity is it, very much attacked, but if you if you want to pay five pounds and get nine hours of reasonably good city building, like hmm. honestly, Max is SimCity is quite it's quite nice. But this one fixes everything that uh, people found wrong with that one. So uh, the cities are still on big square plots. Once you've got enough money, you just buy a big square adjacent plot oh. and continue expanding. Nice. Up to nine tiles, which is fucking enormous. Like, <laughs> you get a huge amount of space. Um, you've got curved roads. Uh, the traffic isn't broken from what I played of it. I played about two hours and it is kind of visually represents the traffic very nicely and you can see where the jams are happening. But, um, it doesn't, everything doesn't grind to a halt if there's like a weird kind of AI bug that causes people to get stuck into each other, which is what happened with SimCity, where hmm. like fire engines couldn't get out of fire stations because of traffic, and then everything burned down, even though you had ten fire stations because <laughs> <laughs> they were all traffic locked. Um, so does, well, it, uh, yeah. uh, does it simulate every citizen individually? Like, uh, they have homes and jobs. I, I don't. I, you can click on every citizen individually, and it will give you their name and their job and how old they are and stuff, and you can tag them and follow them around and even rename them. Uh, and so, like, someone found, a, a, like, a dog. Kind of a jerk mayor. <laughs> <laughs> you, your name is now Bob. <laughs> uh, so, there are animals, and you can rename them as well in the forest. Uh, so, <laughs> that animal, that animal's called James now. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the, the om, om, omniscient power of the mayor in, uh, the city skylines, is that you can just point to any, uh, living creature and <laughs> rename it to, according to your own whim. It sounds like something from Death Note, but like a <laughs> shitty version of Death Note. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it's very hard to tell. Like I don't think it does. The it must kind of fudge it somewhere. Um, if you can't tell, that's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't care if <clears throat> I can't follow it to work and back. Really, as long as yeah. the, the overall simulation works. Like, yeah. yeah, but wasn't that a problem with uh, Maxis's SimCity that it wasn't it wasn't fully simulating things, and because of a result of that, that was causing the traffic jams because citizens would just have like a percentage chance just to go to a home, even mm. if it wasn't theirs, and that yeah. was causing like. Was, I think they, they got in the jams because everyone was simulated in that they had to physically get from home yeah. to to a place of work and oh, order for any business up. to happen. Hmm. But yeah, they didn't care which home they went to and which business <laughs> they went to. They just went to like the nearest one, and that was obviously a simplification for you know um, uh, I don't know efficiency purposes, I guess, to make it simpler and to avoid the kind of horrible jams that they ended up getting into. And yet it also kind of ruins the thing about clicking on someone and seeing where they go hmm. to know that they're not actually going to their real home. Yeah. It makes it kind of pointless. Like, 
we were saying at the time about Sin City, if they just replaced all the cars with uh, a texture that was sometimes denser than sometimes <laughs> yeah. not, which is what old SimCities used to do, yeah. then that actually just communicates everything the player needs to oh, know. Yeah. And the, yeah. the numbers are still crunching underneath it. Because if you don't do that, it's just City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah this is, it, so basically it's got modding support as well, which is, and offline, you can run offline, which is obviously the major thing that people hate oh, about yeah. SimCity. Yeah, man, if you, they're smart to make one, because it's... If you're making a city building game now, you can just get three or four really easy big wins, can't you? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But let's not just not fuck that up and not fuck that up and not fuck that up. <laughs> that, <laughs> now that, three up on SimCity. <laughs> that should be the tagline of uh, <laughs> the Skylines, is that we didn't fuck this, this, or this up. <laughs> uh, and that they, they, they haven't, by, by the looks of it. It's, it was super fun from what I played. But, um, I wouldn't put it past Paradox's marketing guys <laughs> to actually take that. <laughs> yeah. uh, they can have all, that one for free, guys. It's actually... Yeah, if you want to uh, see. As we're talking about it, I realised there's actually a, a pretty um, close precedent for what happened with SimCity in that they wanted this thing of simulating each individual citizen and to do that they A, got themselves in all kinds of like traffic problems that caused your city to kind of fail even when you set it up pretty reasonably and B, they said that was the reason it had to be these small plots of land and you couldn't mm. expand beyond it because it was just too much work to kind of simulate all those individual mm. people. Um, and Supreme Commander 2 the reason all those, uh, the reason the maps are so much smaller than that, everything's just on a much, much smaller scale than Spring Corner 1, um, was actually because of their pathfinding. They have this yeah. neat little thing for pathfinding where if you have two, uh, battalions of tanks and they want to go past each other, mm. they called it flow field technology and they kind of flowed almost like a liquid so that each one would kind of find its path, but they would also, like, smoothly rejoin their form, their, their formation as soon as they could. Whereas in the old Supreme Commander, it's true, if you've got two formations to clash into each other, each individual tank would kind of bump into one, stop, turn around a little bit, try and go around it mm. one way and just dumbly right. bump into it again. Um, and Chris Taylor is obviously really keen on this, and uh, one of the downsides of that was it just took up a lot of memory. So it wasn't like a CPU time thing, it just took up a lot of space in the memory, and that was the thing you need if you want really big maps. Mm. And he said he thought that was a good trade-off, and... Wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty uh, nice pathfinding. I really like Supreme Commander 2 in its own way, right. but uh, it's certainly fair to say that the reduction in map size was one of the key things that kicked the community off against it and mm. made it become a kind of like, um, just was rejected by most of the hardcore fans, it seems like. Mm. So don't get too hung up on one feature and sacrifice everything else for that. It's <laughs> <laughs> my advice to designers everywhere. With a, this, this kind of an element of uh, just making a beautiful, neat thing to uh, City Skylines in that if you try and be too creative and move outside of the block structure, you're basically building something inefficient. Uh, it wants you to make perfectly sized blocks mm-hmm. in order to win. And it's kind of... Uh, I wish there was almost a mode where it didn't incentivize you so much to be so like Borg-like <laughs> in the construction of your cities. Um, because I found myself just trying building a big spirally loopy thing and it wasn't making much money. I was like happy with my big stupid spiral but sad because I couldn't build anything else because the money wasn't coming in fast enough and I ended up having to build the Borg town uh, <laughs> to the southeast where you know everything was Borgy and beautiful and incredibly you know rich and verdant and that funded my insane like spiraling <laughs> sky, sky cities on the other side of the map um, <laughs> and I kind of want to build the stupid spirally sky cities uh, without having to have the giant factory basically I love that I sort of like it's your dirty little secret <laughs> how does this town work it seems so elaborate and fanciful and not efficiency based oh well, there's just a really efficient town over there <laughs> yeah. just take all their money <laughs> yeah it's with Bork South that's uh, funding the entire escalade I mean that, that's kind of it reminds me of how I built my sim city in, in the last iteration of that which was um, figured out pretty quickly that like pollution is a really big deal and happiness goes down around industrial stuff <clears throat> so my city was just like a road that spanned the entire block, the, like the square of land I was allowed to work with, with at one end just all industrial stuff all along that same one road, and at the other end all residential stuff all along that same <laughs> one road. <laughs> just a massive one road town. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. What else did you see? Uh, saw anything you can talk about? Uh, Magicka two. <gasps> Is that good? It's so much fun. Um, you see, I really like Magicka, but it was broken as fuck when uh, I went to play oh, yeah, it and yeah, just yeah. didn't didn't work online, unfortunately. Yeah, QA is one of the things that, um, like every team, 
every year they, they say, say that. Every <laughs> <year>. <laughs> they've said that for at least the last four they, years. They say it every year, uh, but they showed us like diagrams of how their teams are structured. In fact, they, have, they, have, like, <laughs> they showed us diagrams this time. Yeah, they, um, four four QA people to each project. They're very small uh, teams actually. Um, mm. for, for their development studio does. It's not Arrowhead making Magic Two though, is it? Right. Um, hmm. I thought it, I thought they I thought they. I was going to say a bad word there, which implied. Look, emotion look about this I think they've they've now taken ownership let's say of the Magicka franchise I thought paradox they had. I think they have yes. Arrowhead have gone on they meant, meant to make Gauntlet so I think ah right yeah, yeah they're doing their own things there. Things, yeah. uh, like Magicka 2 um, it's uh, very similar to the first game like mm. it's the same elements and the same uh, the same mechanic in that you uh, press keys on your keyboard to summon blobs of these elements and then uh, right click or left click or shift click to you know cast the spells by merging the elements uh, which is just a brilliant system actually for the first game it encourages a kind of uh, manic uh, quite skillful approach uh, mm. like to high level challenges and the good thing about the fights we did in Magic 2 was that the enemies had certain resistances to certain elements so you were encouraged to say oh these guys are good at fire bring out the ice beams and everyone suddenly channels their ice beams when uh, multiple beams converge and they're the same beam they could become like they deflect off each other and become increasingly powerful so you get these absurd beautiful laser displays as everyone deploys this ice beam against the giant fire monster and then a load of ice to do to come in and everyone just brings out flamethrower spells and you know goes oh, to work yeah. Um, the uh, cool thing about Magicka 2 is that there are these uh, really neat modifiers, like rule modifiers you can add, which uh, could do anything from increasing your wizard speed to 300%, or monster speeds to 300%, or um, you know making it so that you can't move if you're casting spells, or making certain elements more powerful or less powerful, mm. um, or making it so that when you kill an enemy, you teleport to where they were when they died, <laughs> uh, making death... Uh, cause explosions or cause implosions that suck people in. Uh, just just a, a huge array of these things, and there, there are plenty. There are plenty of good joke ones as well, like a laughter track that you could turn on, <laughs> things like that. Um, How are these like in the options menu or the yeah. items you find? Or? No, they're, they're, I can't remember what their stupid term for it was, but um, you basically go into the uh, uh, a bit a separate menu and turn them on and off. In, All right, in sequence, mm. in it's like. Um, Unreal Tournament retakers. Retakers, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly, like, it's exactly that ethos that it's tapping into. Um, and whether they realise that directly, like, I, I got a real kind of perfect dark vibe from it, because when I used to play Perfect Butler Dark on the N64, um, it was all about um, the rule sets that my friends made, and we all agreed mm. to play together locally, and, um, and Magic 2 really taps into that. So I was just in a, a couch with three other journalists, and we already we, we settled on a really a rule set we really like to found challenging and balanced for ourselves. So mm. we, we had 300% speed, so we were all zipping around like mad <laughs> rogue idiots. Um, but we had to stop to cast spells um, a la early. <laughs> but, so, you know, there's a risk-reward to uh, stopping to cast a big thing and then moving out of the way. Um, and it was great. Absolutely, it's I mean, a single player game because um, they, they put out Wizard Wars, didn't they? Which is like them sword pseudo MOBA. Yeah, yeah that's kind of a, uh, an arena co mm. battle thing with sort of PvP modes attached to it. I think this is, I think you will, yeah, you play it in single player, but it's designed as a co op game primarily. So I think there'll be co op missions and things. Um, but it's a linear kind of narrative sort yeah. of narrative thing, but with lots of lots of arena modes. So we played lots uh, of arena okay. modes, basically where you fight off waves of enemies hmm. um, and the the consistency of the waves changes depending on the map that you choose. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of hard to really elucidate, like, to really develop thoughts on it because it's so similar to the first game. But the first game is fucking great once you got past uh, the kind of broken elements. Like, after a, <laughs> after all, when, it, when the bugs mm. were eventually fixed, oh, yeah. I had some fantastic times uh, in co-op with it. And uh, this is promising. I feel like I'm almost more interested in playing single player because I liked... The thing I liked was just experimenting and I just... Spend like half an hour just standing in one spot, with no enemies <laughs> even around. So, you know, if I can like summon up these orbs and then turn them into healing orbs, but then protect myself with arcane and then throw it down and around myself, then I blow myself up. <laughs> <laughs> or if I combine this beam and this like stream of steam and then this other thing and then attach it to my sword, then this happens. It's a mean stuff like if there's a river in the middle of the map, like you get wet, and then a wave oh, yeah. electricity enemies will come out from you know, a load of houses, and uh, water plus electricity means almost instant death. Um, or you can just get yourself wet and then accidentally cast a fire, sp- uh, like a, an electric spell on yourself. Or, yeah. Like the there's an amazing scope for malfunction <laughs> in the mechanics, mm. especially in corp, that just makes it really, really, really funny. It's, it's just a it's a wizardy farce, which uh, I love. <laughs> Very colourful as well. Yeah, there aren't that many good slapstick games. No, I don't think, but that is one certainly. Hmm. 
Did you get a cape while you're out at Paradox? Uh, I wore uh, one of uh, the Paradox capes just for <laughs> just for thirty seconds because they all seem to have capes. Because it's very cold out there at this it's, time of year. Yeah, <laughs> it was actually unseasonably warm for the time. Oh right, oh, okay, lovely. Uh, but yeah, it was a, it was, a, it was a thick velvet cloak and uh, gave me uh, plus one awesome <laughs> <laughs> temporarily while I wore it. Uh, I took it off because I was too hot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, they've got uh, they've got a lot of costumes. <laughs> Paradox, a lot of wizardy robe costumes, which they use to make their trailers and things. And they, they like to try and make these viral comedy trailers. And yeah, they're, they're quite a cute company, really. Yeah, I do quite well. They're up to about like 150, 170 staff now. After no worry. and they're publishing Pillars of Eternity. Uh, oh, I didn't know. That. Yep, and hmm. they've got quite a lot of games on the go. So the futures. Hmm. Hmm. Well, they've got a very loyal base of people who are, you know, you're never going to shed people who are, uh, the, the, the Europa Universalist crowd are, I imagine they're only going to get their kicks from Paradox, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Where else do you go, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're the, um, the awesome ghetto for uh, people who love those nerdy strategy games. Which I do too, and, and they kind of, like, Crusader Kings 2 is amazing. Like, mm. It's one of the best strategy games in the, like, in the last five, ten years. Its ability to create stories is just extraordinary. And the, 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 the idea that it's this platform and every six months or a year they release another expansion that just kind of makes it more detailed and a, a better simulation. Mm. Like such a good good model. Like uh, You buy the game once and you, you've got all this kind of ten years of entertainment there for you. Mm. <laughs> which is um, which is really cool. Also the Game of Thrones mod. <laughs> which apparently, talking to Fred Wester, their CEO, uh, he... Uh, had a like a, uh, an appointment with George R. R. Martin back in 2005 to no talk way. about licensing the Game of Thrones wow. license before it became the HBO show. But while oh, but George they did Orr. they did um, they did publish the game by Sinai, didn't they? Perhaps they did. The, was that the shitty um, yeah yeah muddy uh, uh, 3D RPG thing? Yeah, I can't remember what it's called. No, I can't remember either. Um, yeah, but they they uh, they they're nowhere near the license now. Mm. Um, but you said like you said that's the one license they would consider pursuing. Um, I think they don't like the idea of. Uh, giving licensee to which creative control over everything mm. they're doing because um, they're quite team led but uh, yeah that's the one thing you would consider yeah mm. Mm. apparently they were quite uh, HBO were slightly distressed about the Game of Thrones mod oh, really? when it came out because uh, well, it's they... better than all of their efforts <laughs> <laughs> uh, so far yeah definitely um because Kotaku ran an article saying that the, the best Game of, Thrones, Game of Thrones game is actually a mod right. and HBO saw that and then he said wait <laughs> you guys make any money from this are you, are you kind of using it to sell your games and they're like no we didn't write it <laughs> but I'm very I'm sure they're very happy that that uh, is out there. <laughs> yeah yeah anyway what have you been playing Tom um I have totally relapsed on 868 hack Mm. which is the uh, hacking roguelike by Michael Bro, who did um, Vertex Dispenser and Corrupt and this. <laughs> it's done loads of games, but I think those are the best known. Um, and it came out on mobile ages ago. And in fact, even before that, there was... I can't remember if this was public. I think there was a public free PC version. And certainly I played it on PC. Um, I think maybe it was in the IGF, um, or maybe there was just a public version that I played. Um... And I liked it at the time, and then I kind of forgot about it when it came out on mobile. Maybe I didn't have a, a smartphone when it came out on, um, on iOS, but it's just come out on Steam recently, um, and the Steam version is not dramatically different, I don't think, but there's lots I'm discovering that I've never discovered before, and like most of his games, you never really know, like, if you're playing a later version, you never really know, was this always there, or <laughs> have I just unlocked this through... Um, through uh, something I've done because it's seems like a very repetitive roguelike or very very small in scope. There's only it's a grid of like um, it seems like only about sixteen by sixteen tiles or something, um, and that's a room, and it's randomly populated by just squares that are solid and um, an empty space. And the squares that are solid, you can kind of uh, plant a kind of bomb next to them, and then when it detonates, it will kind of steal whatever's next, whatever's in that block. So every block will have either some points in it or a special program, and programs are like spells. Um, and so you plant your bombs strategically to try and get as many points as you can or the, the programs that you think you'll need to um, uh, defeat the enemies which randomly spawn and also spawn in response to you uh, stealing those things. So whatever you steal, it has a kind of a, uh, a cost, and that cost is how many enemies will spawn when you steal it. Hmm. Um, and it's kind of... It's rogue-like... In the 
um, in terms of the way time works, in that nothing happens until you move, and when you move, everything moves. Um, and you can't stay still. Like, you can sit there and wait, but uh, time isn't flowing in the game. And so sometimes you get in a situation where, you're like, you want to stay where you are and have everyone else move, but you can't do that. And so wait is actually a program that you have to get. <laughs> you have to sort of, like, <laughs> find it and unlock it. And it's very random, so there are um, probably, like, 30 different programs you can get, and they're super vital in terms of, like, dealing with enemies. If you don't have any programs at all, uh, it's nigh on impossible. Um, and which ones you get offered, you know, which ones happen to be in the level is is random. And so I've had runs where, as I was getting back into it, I started to sort of settle into this pretty good system of there are four different types of enemies, and one of them's not really a big problem. Um, each one has like a special ability, and the one that isn't a problem to me is the one who's invisible, because they're invisible until they're in your row or your column, and then you can see them. And so you can just kind of manoeuvre carefully. Once you know one is around, you know, get into a situation where you're in a corridor or something, and then they'll come to you, and um, you can deal with them. The others are like, one can move double speed, which is horrible, because it means they move faster than you, mm. so... Um, you can't get away from them if, you, if they're chasing you, but also, more importantly, um, if you get enemies into like a nice little funnel and they're all coming one after the other and you can just kill them all as they come, um, you can get a situation where this turn there's an enemy in front of you and you can kill him, but there's a fast enemy behind him, so when you kill him in the, the same turn, the fast enemy will move into his place and get to attack you before you can do anything about it. And then there's one that can move through walls and there's one that's extra tough. And those last three... Um, each have a kind of anti-program for them. So for the, the fast one, that's called a virus, and there's literally an anti-virus program, and that just hurts all the viruses on the, in the whole room. So you could, if there's loads of them, you can just use that twice, and it kills them all. Hmm. Um, the tough one, you can explode him, so it um, damages all the enemies near him. And the uh, one that can move through walls, you can kill him if he's currently in a wall. So they're called um, glitches, and the program that kills them is called debug. Um, huh. So anything that's like glitchy gets killed. Um, so my system was like, buy those three, or get those three as, uh, as soon as I can, and then I've got like an antidote for everything, and the, the invisible ones I can deal with by myself. Um, and I thought, yes, I figured out this game. <laughs> but it's very, the thing I love about it, the, thing, the reason it works so well, is that it's kind of up to you how much challenge you want to take on. If your objective mm. is just to get through those eight levels, that's difficult at first until you really like, get the hang of the game. But, well, actually, no, it's still difficult for me. <laughs> Thinking about it, I do often die before I get through the eight levels. But um, if you just try and get to the exit on each level, um, it's a challenge, and once you've done it, you get a score of zero. <laughs> right. Because you only get score if you actively go out and get some score. You know, these blocks that have score in them don't do anything except give you score. So if you're just trying to survive, you would never I activate see. one. Right. Because they summon enemies. So if, to get seven points, you're going to summon seven enemies in this room right now. And usually there are other enemies, enemies already around, so sometimes, mm. like, I've set up a bomb that triggered, like, one nine-point block and one seven-point oh. block. <laughs> so it's, like, 16 <laughs> enemies, and they're already some in the room. It's like, nearly every cell of this room is now an enemy. <laughs> yeah, the rooms aren't that large. No. <laughs> so if you, how, surely that would fill every every square on the board. It gets close, yeah. I mean, right. um, and then there's there's got so many little, like, quirks that are really satisfying, really neat, because there's... As well as being antidotes to like individual enemies, there's certain things that work well in, re- in certain situations. And one is called delay, and it means when an enemy spawns, it's kind of in their... I think of them as eggs. They're just kind of like swirly blobs. You can't tell what's going to come out. Mm-hmm. Next turn, they'll come out. If they never spawn in your direct line of sight, if they can help it. Um, but if you can get to one before it hatches, then you can kill it in one hit. And you can never normally do that because it takes one turn to move, and then they'll, they would have hatched by then. But there's one called delay, which just stops them all from hatching for, like, three turns. So while they're all still eggs, you can just kind of mow them down. <laughs> so, like, the, if I've got the resources to use that a bunch of times, sometimes I'll just trigger all... I'll steal all of the most valuable things in the room, like, all at once if I can, if I can set up a bomb to do that, and just bring down the wrath of God on me, just fill the <laughs> entire room with those yeah. things, and then just delay, kill three things, delay, kill three things, delay, kill three oh. things. Mm. Um, and that's awesome. And also... You're only trying to get to the exit, so even on the last level, you don't have to like kill everything like you do in Hoplite. Um, wait, well, you don't have to kill everything in Hoplite. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what am I thinking of? Anyway, uh, even on the last level, you just have to leave. So, huh. um, 
you on the last level you always want to steal just everything because you don't have to deal with the consequences on every other level these enemies that you summon even if you get to the exit they'll come with you to the next level and all of the enemies that are on the next level too will be added to that so you'll, you bring in like a <laughs> little posse of hi oh, yeah, I brought these guys with me too right um, but on the last level who cares because the game's over mm-hmm. so um, you always just steal like all the most valuable things and bring down all the, the enemies um and then just try and get to the exit. And delay is great for that too, because fill up the room with eggs, essentially, and then just freeze them and then quickly slip out the exit <laughs> and leave. This is uh, great to hear about other builds, because I, I picked this up last week. We're playing on an iPad, actually, and, and the phone uh, version, which is the same, I think, as the PC. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, after a long day of playing strategy games at Paradox.com, I'll go back to my room and then play 868 hat for like two hours <laughs> and then fall asleep. Uh, head full of um, like squares. <laughs> things attacking each other in them. But uh, yeah, I kind of uh, I like to do a really tanky build where I go for reset which uh, oh, yeah. resets your health back to full if you can pay for it. And uh, exchange which lets you um, funnel money into energy. Those These are the two types of resources. When you blow up squares you get those resources. So um, I'd summon like nine or ten enemies find like a tight corridor and then just shoot them all as they came down the corridor and any uh, after a few hit me I'd just like reset and then mm. more would hit me and then I'd go like okay energy exchange reset and then just kill everything like a giant stupid uh, <laughs> attack monster but it's, it's kind of cool that it enables such different play styles even yeah. on a small board there's one ability uh, program that's just called undo and it only costs one dollar to use but it takes you back to you know just takes you back one turn and so it doesn't help really in terms of like your situation will will be exactly like it was when you last fucked this up but now you've got one dollar less <laughs> and it's great because it's like it's when you're thinking about do i need that because like every other program you know to get it is going to cost you something um and it's going to make some energy show up so you're thinking do i need the undo am i going to fuck something up because <laughs> anytime undo is useful you literally made an error of judgment you did something wrong like you shouldn't have done that so in theory it's possible to never need undo <laughs> because oh, i'll just always do the perfect thing um, but I usually get. <laughs> <laughs> it's really um, it's surprisingly cute as well because the all the monsters have their own like uh, different array of noises, which are kind of riffing on Batman noises, uh, like kind of, yeah. kind of noises, which is uh, which is nice. I like that. And also, <laughs> if you if you get the kind of the vision uh, program. Which lets you uh, see every like when the eggs spawn. Vision lets you see what they're going to be before yeah. they spawn. And the invisible enemies, you can see them all the time. They're revealed, and also like any sometimes some programs are mystery programs, um, so you, that it reveals those as well. But it also gives you a little smiley face avatar, a third eye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's loads of little jokes like that, like packed just throughout the, the whole thing. It's awesome. It's very cute. There's also so this is something I I don't know if it was in the build I played before, but now. Um, when you complete, if you get out alive, because uh, it's possible to get loads of points and then just die and still do well in the high score tables because you've got a lot of points. Um, and like I say, like getting the points is easy. It's dealing with the consequences of it that's difficult. So if you're going to let yourself die, like if you just get to a level where it has loads and loads of points and you have enough siphon things, the bomb things to use to get them, then you could just get them all and let yourself die because um, you'll still have some points. But the one advantage of getting through alive is that the next time you play it's counted as sort of continuing and you lose all your abilities and stuff. You're still like technically a new avatar, but your score for this run will be added to the score from the last run in a different high score table. So that's called like the streak high scores. And it's just how many times you've success successively completed the game. But like the first time you, you loop, the first time you get through it and then start a new game, um, you get, like a bonus, you unlock something for having completed it, and you get like a new ability will become available. And in addition to being seeded throughout the game as a thing you can pick up for that life, you get given it for free, right, right at the start. Huh. So the last one I got was like fucking blew my mind because it was um, attack plus, and it's an ability that costs loads of energy and money to use, but it upgrades your basic attack to do two damage instead of one for the rest of that room. Um, which is nuts because everything only has two health, so you're just like, well, now just kill everything in one hit. <laughs> you just become like a, a super thing. And so that's great. And then I've just started to get to the point where I can loop like twice, so I get, I have a third run through. Um, and after you complete your second run through, uh, the first time I did it, it, um, said, uh, like, bonus power unlocked, re-mounted laser. I was like, oh, brilliant, because when you move towards stuff, you laser it. And I thought, great, now it's going to laser out the back as well. I'll kill two things at once. And I'm starting to realize Michael Bros 
power up unlocked message is slightly ironic because what he really means is it only comes out the back now <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I can't attack that? anything I'm moving towards Amazing. and worse that's not really the disadvantage the disadvantage is that I can't run away from anything ever it's behind <laughs> me if I want to move away from it uh, I attack. automatically attack it instead of moving okay. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of that's just awkward and I got used to it and I made a few mistakes because I wasn't I forgot that I had it but eventually I got used to it the next time I looped twice uh, the bonus power up was the invisible enemies can now teleport <laughs> while invisible so <laughs> there's just no knowing where they are they just could be absolutely anywhere absolutely anytime <laughs> and that's I don't know a lot of times it's like something new has happened that's been difficult to deal with and I'm like oh this is bullshit I don't like this and then eventually I get used to it and think no actually that's really good because you like <laughs> it's cool for this reason um, currently the teleporting invisible ones <laughs> I'm having a hard time seeing the upside of that <laughs> that seems like just randomly they'll just take a health point off you just there's no way to know that could, that was going to happen if you got that third eye thing then mm. great but I was looking out for that and it wasn't didn't come up on any of the levels that I got to that's and it. I just got killed by constantly taking damage from invisible teleporting enemies <laughs> I like the idea that kind of un- un- achievement unlocked uh, milestones can be used to tone difficulty. So you're mm. clearly very experienced if you've got to that level. So in order to keep the game interesting for you, it introduces this d- dangerous new element that you now have to deal with. Yeah. It's quite clever, actually. I'm not sure quite the many of the games mm. that really do that. There's so many little elegant things like that. Like um, there's an ability called Score. Oh, yeah. And all it does is it costs like five energy to use, and it just gives you some points. <laughs> but the twist is it gives you the number of points... Uh, equivalent to the number of levels left in the current run. So, because when I first got it, it was like, oh, it gives me score for energy. Great, I'll just play the game normally, and then when I get to the last level, whatever energy I've got, I'll, I'll spend it all on the score thing. And it wouldn't let me use it at all, because on level 8, there are zero levels left to go. <laughs> so it gets you zero points. It's expensive as well. If you use it on level 1, you get seven points for every time you use it. Use it. So, But of course, on level 1, you don't have a reserve of energy built up yet. So it's like, if you see it on level 1, you grab it, and then use all of your rest of your or the other siphon you get to get as many energy points as possible then you use it on that level and then as you go throughout the game you're always like it's always encouraging you to blow all of your resources really really early and leave yourself with nothing for the next level and of course the game's getting harder as well and you're unlocking more and more programs that are useful and sometimes essential to get by and they all consume these resources so as you need more resources you're being more and more encouraged to get rid of them (laughs) and it gets to the point where like it's so satisfying to do it when it works because it's just like three points. <laughs> like no more enemies came. Like, I just used this thing. I just like made this deal with the devil and got some <laughs> some free points. And when you're getting seven points for it, that's great. And when it goes down to like four, it's like ah, oh, it's still just about worth it. <laughs> and then you're getting like three. <laughs> it's like ah, uh, am I just pouring my resources into a hole? Is this why I'm so fucked because I spent all my fucking money on this? <laughs> but it's always like everything in it. It's like testing you to to bet on yourself it's saying like I'm sure you're good enough to do this like if you just if you're willing to just take a little bit of a risk you can have all these points and you'll do better and better but yeah stuff that like self balances like that is really appealing to me at the moment that's actually I mean it's I'm coming off at it fresh off Invisible Ink and they're really similar actually <laughs> for all the visual differences Invisible Ink is beautiful and this is frankly very ugly <laughs> <laughs> no it's the perfect aesthetic for the game I think you'll find Tom. I think I, the, I like uh, his aesthetic more than some of his other games. Uh, hmm. There are others where like, I just sort of can't even see what's going on. It might just be that I'm really used to this one because I've played it for a long time. But yeah. It's very low res. The thing I can't cope with is the music. Um, oh, God. Which is sort of discordant, atonal. Like, it sounds like music that's, that's been put through something mm-hmm. <laughs> and that came out wrong, uh, which I'm sure is intentional. It's all about glitches and things going badly wrong. And it's, like I say, the sound effects are like Pac-Man, but sort of hmm. gone what? bad. And... Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but because I play it for a long time, mm. I okay. get sick of the music. So I've, I've hacked my version appropriately <laughs> enough. Because there's no, there's no option to turn it off. So, um, I think with the version I had before, I could just like delete the music files. Uh, but then it, in this version, it crashes if the music files aren't there. And there's like 12 of them. So I've had to find a silent OG file and go through it, copy it 12 times and rename it to all of the 12 files. <laughs> <laughs> just so it won't play any fucking music. Oh. <laughs> so I can listen to my own. It's actually, it's quite, um, it's an interesting ambience if it doesn't have any music because there's still sound effects and there's kind of like there's some noises just kind of going on in the background anyway and every sound effect seems to me mind you the thing is with Michael Bros games you can never tell whether something's a bug or an aesthetic decision but the sounds get worse as you play like the further towards the end of the run you get the more distorted they become and the more it sounds like I thought it was like wrong with my speakers at first because like a sound effect would 
just be really crackly and scrapey and also like last for twice as long as it should. Mm. And so I don't know for sure that it isn't a bug. <laughs> it's certainly a interesting aesthetic. Do you think you should make prettier games? Where do you fall on that? Because there are, I, the reason I said earlier is that it's the perfect aesthetic for it is that there are defenders of Michael Brew's aesthetic who say that it is ugly for a reason. It must be ugly. You can't make a, a more pretty game and for it still to mean the same thing as a yeah. Michael Brew game, which I think is probably shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, quite, I quite like 868 hacks. Uh, aesthetic, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are things I'd definitely fix, like the dark... Um, so the the name of each program is in dark yeah. purple against black, hmm. and that's just bad. Like you, you have to be able to read what it is. I mean, if you, if, you know. But apart from that, I think it's, it's, the idea of being this crackly, shitty mainframe is exactly what the, the setting is, isn't it? Yeah, it sort of suits it. And also, okay. like I mean, we've seen loads of super slick depictions of cyberspace. I quite hmm. like one that's fragmented and a bit fucked <laughs> up. In general, though, is the question like I do find some of the other games off-puttingly ugly <laughs> or just like mm. not to my taste um, and the question of like should he you know use a, a different artist or change his own mm. art style or something is like if he's happy doing it that way then fine <laughs> he shouldn't be forced to or anything no, no, of course but not. he certainly I feel like his games are, are Asus Gate is like really brilliant and actually very accessible yeah, it's, it's got like, a really good tutorial it. now um, oh right it's quite simple all the like the I really bounced off it when I first quickly. played it because I because your explanation there just uh, it made clear a lot of things that were definitely not clear to me <laughs> uh, when I played it. There is a good tutorial now. Yeah. Uh, it, it gives you, like, portions of the board, and then you fight from one portion to the next, and it explains. Uh, and, and yeah, apparently, um, he's done a blog post about racing it on PC, because it's apparently been two years, and um, if I remember right, he hasn't done much in that time, like, according to his post. Um, and he said it's just been really dispiriting, because he's got lots of of iOS games out now and every time they update iOS he has to patch them all because it mm. breaks them all oh, and every cool. time they release a new phone he's got to support new oh, resolutions shit. and stuff and he just as I would hates it <laughs> <laughs> and um, says it just kind of drains his energy to make new things and he mm. just feels like you know making yeah another new thing would just be another fucking thing he's got to maintain all the time um, which rather begs the question why he didn't just put them on Steam in the first place mm. maybe I suppose like Greenlight has been pretty harsh on stuff that doesn't you know look mm, gorgeous itself, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's like so Asics 8 hack is massively well respected in the sort of yeah. game particularly the game development community I think among journalists as well yeah that's great um, and Corrypt which I haven't uh, that's a game that initially seems about pushing blocks around and has this annoying thing I find it annoying that the blocks you push around stick to you so you can't drop them mm. you have to kind of scrape them off yourself <laughs> and I found that very irritating I didn't really like block pushing puzzles inherently anyway like I like them if they're amazing and blow my mind but this one wasn't I think doing it for me later and yeah oh, so I keep I keep hearing that there's a moment at which it um, fundamentally changes but I couldn't get that far I was just stuck on basic blocks shoveling stuff but the that is also like widely regarded as one of the greatest puzzle games ever made mm. and like mm. revelatory um, so it is weird or something slightly wrong with the picture that he's like sort of scraping by I think I mean I don't know what, what his actual personal finances are like but in the blog post he says that they're, they're selling some copies but not many yeah you'd think 868 hack would have enough momentum behind it to do pretty yeah. well but, hmm. shame if it isn't hmm and yeah, that's the one where, you know, its art style is kind of okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, probably the one least in need of, or least suffering from its art style, at least. Mm. Commercially. Marsh. Mm-hmm. What have you been playing? Sorry um, to ask you in the middle of a... Sort of this bit. week. Yeah, um, I've been playing, well, I've been playing lots of things, actually, since our last was on the podcast. I want to talk about Life is Strange, but I, I can't talk about it for long, because I've completely erased nearly everything I thought about <laughs> it three weeks ago mm. when I played it. Um, it's a sort of telltale-ish sort of game set in a, a school. I uh, it's a I, I don't know. I can't. I don't really understand the American system of schooling, but it seems to be for people who are eighteen and yet very kind of. It's not doesn't feel like a university sort of scenario. Maybe it does. I don't really understand. But any, anyway, high school. Um, yeah. I don't know, but she's, the, the, the character that you play in is studying photography, like, exclusively. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, hang on, maybe she does study science as well. 
Oh god, I don't even know. But anyway, um, it's set in this uh, this school, and um, the uh, the kind of principal hook of it is that you have you suddenly discover that you have time control powers, um, <laughs> and you are thrust very forward into the future, where you see uh, a glimpse of some terrible calamity befalling the town, and then you suddenly return to lessons and then you kind of try and find some resolution for that and then you realise that you can deal with certain social problems by reversing them and um, but it proceeds in the sort of way that a kind of a, a telltale game might that you have conversations that you navigate in social situations that you can choose between and these sort of things um, um, but one of the th- it's not it's kind of quite a nice it's kind of a nice setting i mean somebody somebody could said it was uh i think it's on the, one of their promotional posters but it's it's uh, gone home meets twin peaks and like I, you know that is a pretty good kind of <laughs> uh hybrid to describe it hmm. and it, it it's kind of nice it's a bit kind of cloying in in how Laser focused, its attempt to nail that aesthetic is like there's the there's this kind of twangly kind of inoffensive guitar pop that the, the girl likes to listen to, which is quite possibly the kind of thing that uh, American girls of the age of eighteen like to listen to, but it's obviously awful. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know all the fonts are that that hand drawn indie font. Isn't it uh, everything that you can interact with kind of outlined in a squiggly, acute kind of squiggly animation, yeah, yeah. which I mean, which is Sabrina the Teenage Witch, right? I mean. Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the aesthetic they've accidentally stumbled on there. Yeah, totally. But it's also quite charming. I, I, we were talking just before the podcast started that apparently some people have really uh, gone against the writing, and I thought the writing was fairly uh, inoffensive to good, <laughs> somewhere between those points. <laughs> there, were some, there were some clankers. I can't remember what they were now. And there's some really bad actors in it. Mm. But on the whole, it's, it seems pretty good. But the, um, the thing that I like about it in comparison with the Telltale games. So, like, to Telltale games, to take the uh, the recent Game of Thrones game, the reason I really dislike that is that Telltale games, the choices in it are so prescriptive and contrived, and there's a sense of enforced um, parallelism in the way that reality unfolds. So you can choose choice A, and you get choice A1, choice A2, choice A3, or you can choose choice B and you get choice B1, which B, B2 and B3. And they're an exact kind of mirror right. of each other. And like, that's so offensive for somebody trying to, uh, <laughs> offensive is a bit strong. <laughs> uh, is it, it's, it's so wrong for, for the world of Game of Thrones because Game of Thrones is about chaos and just events rolling on and uh, emergency and all these things that can't be predicted. But if you could, the choices that you'd make would be very asymmetrical. And actually, what this does, somebody's played, like, Telltale games, and they've played uh, Heavy Rain, and they've gone, why do we make these these kind of mirror decisions? Wouldn't it be so much fun if you could just instantly replay the decision you made and saw what else would happen? Right. And actually, that has an effect of kind of resolving a lot of the contrivances that are inherent in that genre, because... You can suddenly, you, you can play something through and then just for laughs you can see what happens when you, you make fun of the posh girl in the school for getting paint on her. And then you can choose to follow the kind of, the better part of your nature and do the right thing. Right. And actually <laughs> that does have, unlike, I mean, some of it, there are still kind of, Ooh, messages on the screen like you know, it, uh, the kind of telltale, they'll remember this kind of thing or mm. this will have repercussions later kind of messages. But, most of the time, judging by the percentage, uh, this is what other people did making these decisions that you get shown at the end, you get a kind of screen at the end which tells you how other people did their decisions. Most people did the same thing. Eventually. Steve Gaynesh showed a screenshot of um, his summary on that and one of his decisions only 1% of players did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Which was blame something on Ramona. I don't know what that means. Ah, I don't remember um, that, yeah. But it sounded like I can only imagine that in context it must be a wildly unreasonable thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, I, I quite like that because it it actually means that... I mean, because I, I believe that there is, like, morality in the universe and I think there are better decisions than others and games that don't reinforce that message reinforce something very strange and corrosive, yeah, I think. Yeah. And actually, mm-hmm. when you have a game like this that allows you to uh, kind of exert your id and then choose to do the right thing. I think that's a really good... I think it's just something really pleasing about that. The two, my main, two main motivators for making a decision in a game are 
A, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> or B, I'm pretty sure from the way this is set up, I'm going to be rewarded for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> this just seems like that. Like this is the virtuous option. They always not only thank you for doing the virtuous option, but also materially reward you more in mm. video games. That's just to become a universal thing now. You always just get more profit for doing the right thing. Mm. Therefore, I'm motivated, even bribed, to do the right <laughs> thing, which completely yes. ruins the element of choice. There's an element, especially in adventure games, where they can't punish you. There's no way to punish the player for making a poor decision. Mm. Like, because you have, there's no oh, health yeah. bar, there's no inventory or kind of way to stop your progress or impinge you in any way. So it, there is no sense that everything you do is equal. No, you will progress at exactly the same rate, <laughs> no matter whether you slay everyone or give everyone mm. sweets. You know, like, th- there's no way for them to gate you. Um, that's the chronic problem with the adventure game morality thing, unfortunately. But it sounds, mm. this, uh, this, kind of fudgy way of doing it sounds like a... Yeah, you couldn't do that in every game. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, suddenly everybody in Game of Thrones has got time reverse powers. (laughs) Thrones are strange. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But uh, there's... I mean, I'm not... I don't want to sing the the game's praises too much. I did quite like it and found it quite charming, but there's Mm. there's some bullshit in it um, uh, where your time reverse powers are just not available for you to use during (laughs) certain key decisions. I can see how it would undermine, like... A lot of dramatic tension. <laughs> you can just always rewind. And... Yeah, this, 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 this dickhead comes up and beats up your friend, and you're just like, "I'm going to get in a car and drive off." <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm going to. I just reverse that fight until I beat hit the shit out of him. Yeah. You know. <laughs> anyway, like, remember yeah, Heroes, like, where one of the tomorrow. one of the characters can reverse mm-hmm. time in Heroes, and then they just sort of like ninety percent of the time just have to mm-hmm. forget the has it because otherwise all drama is dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got to say, the high school setting, I'm quite torn by it because uh, I hate everything. All television and films set in high schools, I invariably hate them because all the mm. characters' problems I don't care about and <laughs> think they should probably stop stressing about their stupid problems. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in video games, I find it fascinating. I love <laughs> the high school really? setting. Yeah, I love Persona. Like, Persona 4, for example. Mm-hmm. I, I love the kind of uh, doing the gossip in the day and then fighting the demons at night <laughs> and then go back in the day. That's and going, not what most high school is like, I think. Maybe it's because they make high school, <laughs> high school fun. and. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I don't know. The, the, I really... I find... Mundan, m- mundanity, mundane, yeah. Yeah. the mundane novel in video games in a way that I, I despise in other mediums. Oh, I don't mind that it's m- and mundane. I think I, I just, um, I don't even dislike it particularly. I, but I don't find that I, I really understand or empathise deeply with the kinds of social cliquery that goes on and seems to be the kind of the principal problem yeah. that assails the lives of eighteen-year-olds in American dramas. Yeah, I just like, to, I don't know if it's like. Maybe American schools are really like that, and they're all based on that. <laughs> or maybe yeah. it's it's the fact that they're fictional that makes them all really similar, but also <laughs> very unrelatable. Yeah, I don't know. The um, but it is actually it's a really beautiful uh, looking. They've actually well, it's, I mean, it's it's very nicely made, but they've made some really weird choices. Like there seems to be some of it is photo real in the way that the unreal engine is definitely trying to go towards you know i mean it's not, it's not quite... ads and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 but you know you know the unreal engine can put out some pretty impressive looking yes. stuff and it's obviously going towards that but then you get close to certain kind of textures like anything like a, a poster and it's obviously been just kind of kind of speed painted or scribbled <laughs> and but i mean that's the part of it's just so you kind of like things at distance look kind of like any other unreal engine game almost photo real then you go close to it and all the textures are these kind of hand-drawn stuff which fits with the kind of Sabrina the Witch aesthetic and I don't, I don't know, it's kind of strange the, the, something really annoyed me uh, it has a, like a cloud of starlings swirling around but it's a particle effect so the starlings just eventually the kind of particles just die and so the starlings <laughs> get to the edge of the cloud and they just disappear <laughs> you're like that's not fooling anybody <laughs> um, the the uh, <laughs> The other game I wanted to pack, talk, talk about is um, Grow Home. Ah, the Ubisoft. Um, uh, yeah, it's by Reflections, who I think are mm. the the studio up up north, aren't they? Why are they here in the? Uh, uh, I thought they were aren't the people who made uh, Driver San Francisco. I should probably have looked at this before. That's a, that's I that's the a podcast. switch of tone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? Well, yeah, but I mean they're an interesting studio, I, I think. And um, isn't Driver San Francisco the one where you can possess other? 
drivers. Yes, it I is. I really want to play this. Oh, it's, it is fantastic. It's a coma. A, it is the best game about a coma, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is not... There are a lot of games much. about comas. There <laughs> really are lots of Indian <laughs> Yeah. Games. Yeah, it's, it's very... Uh, it's kind of like Quantum Leap. There's one called uh, Coma. Very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Drive of San Francisco is uh, it's, it's really nice. It's just kind of... It's got this kind of chirpy Sunday morning TV serial kind of writing to it. It's quite funny oh, and, like this. and weird. Like and, and the whole kind of just repossessing different vehicles across the city is just an immense fun. Great. Um, I should have called it Repo Man. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. Uh, but now they've made Grow Home, which is... Um, a game in which you play a robot who has to climb up a series of um, floating islands, and f- and it's just uh, I mean, there's not really much more to it than that. I mean, is it like a linear single player thing? Like, it was all yeah. pre-made. Yes, levels? it. Yes, I think so. I mean, it, it has a kind of lo-fi polygonal look that you kind of associate with procedurally generated things. I don't think it is procedurally generated, <laughs> or at least I mean. If it is procedure generated, it's procedure generated the exact same way for everybody who plays mm. it, as far as I know. Um, but the, it, I, I'm, I'm sure again, like they've, they, this, this, this group of people have looked at, um, Starseed Pilgrim and thought, well, we can make something mm. a bit like that, but maybe less uh, obtuse. Um, and so you're this little robot, um, uh, called Bud and you're kind of, you're, the the computer that you uh, or the mothership is called Mom, which is quite cute. And uh, whenever a message comes in, he gets Mom. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just um, but you know everything about it is sort of kind of just the teetering on the saccharine, but really, really endearing. It's it's kind of just gorgeously lit. And mm. um, the fact they were inspired by Wally. Oh yeah, which now makes sense. Makes yeah, sense. that does actually all the kind of. Uh, what you were saying about the, all the, the interesting kind of pac man noises, like he's making all the kinds of noises of dot matrix printers and things like ah, that. Yes. And it's, uh, there's an era of sound that is not around anymore, mm. but it's it's kind of, it's very nostalgic for me. power for it, yeah. But um, the the way you kind of navigate these, these floating um, islands is that you have to grow a star plant, and you do that by... Um, Climbing up it, and you has this kind of quop, quop no, not really quop. I mean, you uh, have to use a gamepad for it, and you can use alternate triggers to kind of, uh, and a, and a, and one of the analog sticks to kind of direct your hands and then anchor them. Oh, yeah. um, and it feels really good mm. to do that. Uh, the kind of the way that the procedural animation system makes sense of your body after that doesn't really work. <laughs> so you kind of just spaz out on the rock. <laughs> but, but but I mean, it, it feels nonetheless very satisfying to do, and. There's uh, an amazing sense of vertigo when you're kind of just climbing up this kind of overhang, and you look down. I can feel my balls just trying to shrink back into my body. <laughs> um, but um, do you die if you fall? Uh, you, uh, from a certain height, yes. But uh, eventually, you begin to you collect more gems, which are kind of locked in in the in the landscape. And you actually yank them out of the rock using this this kind of anchoring system, which is very satisfying. And then you you get certain power ups that allow you to kind of better navigate or mitigate the damage from falls but you just respawn if you if you um, right. break yourself but you climb up this plant and then there's kind of spurs from it that you grab hold of and then you can press x and they suddenly start growing and you can kind of ride them like a, a like a it's a bit phallic really um but mm-hmm. you know like the uh, the bomb out of um uh, uh strange love Doctor strange yes dog strange love it's kind of mount it and then direct them into some of the floating islands, which have these kind of green oozy bases, which is obviously some kind of I don't know, fertilizer for the, the overall plant. And once you do that, the plant kind of grows even further, and then more spurs emerge from it. And so you kind of slowly so kind of make your way up through the sky. And um, it's just a, it's a really pleasant experience. We often get questions about what games are good for children on the mm. podcast, mm. and that's I, I think it's uh, it's not s- so challenging that it would. Um, beat a, a seven-year-old, but it's also uh, interesting and enjoyable enough that I, I, my simple mind is entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it sounds weird. Yeah. Wait, are you, like, when you're riding those plant stem things, are you freely steering it? Is yeah, there's a bit of resistance to it, and occasionally they kind of veer off, but yeah. yeah you can so you're kind of making your own yeah. vines, or like, it's sort of yeah, taste? Yeah, absolutely. There's a limit to the, the amount that they can grow, so sometimes you, you need order to reach a certain Floating island, you'll need to you need to plan a bit before you can right. you know fire one off. But yeah, yeah sounds cool. Yeah, it's really nice, very satisfying game. Good chill out game. Group meet Starseed Pilgrim. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's how I should pitch it to the twenty five people in the world who <laughs> know both the games. Tom, 
What have you been playing? <laughs> I've been playing Total War Attila. Ah. Which is a kind of a standalone expansion um, to Rome 2, or a sequel, I guess, <laughs> of sorts, um, which is set during at the um, very beginning of the Dark Ages, when the Roman Empire was in collapse, and uh, barbarians were nicking their biscuits, mm. quite literally raiding them from every angle. Uh, the Roman Empire is divided into Western and Eastern factions, and in this period of um, also this climate change rushing in from the north and freezing everyone, and, uh, yeah, you get to take charge of any of the factions involved <laughs> in huh. this terrible time and uh, try and basically survive in a horrible brown world <laughs> that is uh, descending into darkness, um, which is kind of great uh, for a, a total war game. A game all about war and pillaging and burning. And uh, hmm. um, it's especially fun to play as the Hun, Huns, um, who are obviously a, it's named after Attila. And he's like, you start before he's born and his birth... Uh, among other things, are apocalyptic sigils that echo across the land. So whatever <laughs> whatever uh, faction you play as, you'll get a massive bonging message uh, saying, Attila is born in the east, <laughs> uh, he is coming, kind of thing. And uh, because uh, the Romans, um, who were Catholics at the time, they thought the apocalypse was actually happening. A lot of those kind of apocalyptic, apocalyptic sense because they were being attacked from every, every angle. And if you play as the Western Roman Empire... Uh, it's basically the hardest position to play as in the game. Like, you're giving a little difficulty rating at the start when you choose to begin a campaign. And that difficulty is, like, legendary because they were just torn apart very, like, gradually over the course of uh, mm. uh, decades by just relentless barbarian attack. And, of course, um, because uh, much of the, bar- uh, the Gothic hordes didn't have written language, the reason why we call it the Dark Ages is because they didn't... There is no history beyond that point because no one wrote anything down. So there is this kind of uh, feeling of inky blackness kind of coming down uh, mm. over the world, and that's reflected visually in the kind of uh, this Instagram filter that seems to have been applied <laughs> to a total map, uh, where everything is slightly brown and sepia, and um, uh, almost all the skies are overcast, uh, overcast in battles. And even when they're not, there's this kind of hazy uh, darkness, dark red skies to them. And then, and then the really... dark ages gave way to the hashtag no filter ages. <laughs> No, as well. It's a it's, it's a stark contrast to Rome Two, which is um, absolutely uh, beautiful, beautifully colourful, like it's beautiful sunshine. When you uh, the post processing changes depending on where you pan over in the map in Rome Two. So if you go over into uh, the Mediterranean, suddenly you get this kind of wonderful warm heat, and uh, all the textures are different and sandy mm. and, and beautiful. And then you go off into uh, Scotland, and everything is. Uh, is is cold and uh, looks like Saving Private Ryan. Uh, that kind of filter, where like mm. that sharpness filter comes in, comes in. Whereas, uh, but so they're, they're so good at committing to to creating a mood even um, in a grand strategy game, which is really like no other company really devotes resources to doing that in the same way as the Creative Assembly to creating this kind of aesthetic, uh, aesthetically contiguous thing that gives you a real sense of being in that time, as as the historical historians have seen it. Um, like as a strategy game. It's pretty good, though it is based on Rome 2's kind of design, uh, and therefore suffers from the same problems. The same systems that were malfunctioning in Rome 2 um, are still problematic in Attila, <laughs> especially the politics system, um, which I, I just don't... Under- I've played so much Rome 2 now and a lot of Attila, I just don't understand what I'm supposed to do with it and what it's for. Hmm. Uh, you can see your family tree and... You've got your system of government, and there's a, a bar that tells you how much control you have over your faction, your um, uh, your state, or whatever. And you can promote family members into positions of power, and that will increase your control over your faction. But the more you increase your control, the more you're punished by various kind of negative kind of you get stat to be debuffs to your your civilization for becoming too powerful. And in when I'm the Huns. <laughs> Like the like, if I become a warlord, don't I want to just be the most powerful, unchallenged warlord I can be in order to run this faction most effectively? Like that, like it doesn't really make any sense to me. I can't think what you're supposed to do because if you if you promote your guys, they become more influential. If they become too influential, then you start getting debuffs, so you can assassinate your own people. <laughs> There's like, why would I? Why would I do that? And some of them are generals, of course, like in the, uh, the Roman Senate, generals and politician. Be- had political roles um, so your best generals are out there and they're like really powerful in the senate and if they're like I'm not going to k- 
kill him off if he's the leader of my biggest army. And like, I don't, I don't understand what the system is for or what it wants me to do. It just seems to be arbitrarily fucking with me <laughs> for no, for no apparent reason. So the, the only solution is to leave it completely alone. And that's an entire strata of just, you know, uh, it should be important and it should be kind of necessary to running your empire or whatever. Hmm. Um, and that it still has those problems, and that's just because of the way that that entire system is designed from the ground up for Rome too, which they haven't redesigned it because it's kind of built so deep in those systems now that they just can't kind of drag mm-hmm. it out and untangle it. Um, however, the stuff they've done with the factions uh, outside of the politics system is great. So the Huns, uh, they don't have towns in the traditional sense that you upgrade in order to build new people. They're completely roaming clans, and your armies at a click of a button can become a settlement anywhere. <laughs> The enemy territory, just so you can go right up to Constantinople, the, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, the, probably one of the most faction, powerful factions on the board. You can just camp outside Constant, uh, Constantinople. <laughs> and if they can't move you, you're still staying there, <laughs> <laughs> eating their food, uh, you know, raiding their villages, taking their shit. And um, their, their rule set is fantastic because it really encourages you to be incredibly aggressive and to just burn just to just move and burn and move on oh, and God. burn and uh, then raise another army and then move that army uh, north to burn the north while you know you go uh, east to the Sassanids and burn them and like you, it's very hard to begin with because they, you only have like two, arm, two or three armies to, to use but the sense of momentum that you get by playing as the Huns is um, both immense and very reflective of their astonishing impact on that historical period. Hmm. Like, so, through mechanics, they've realised the, the terrifying force, and it's, it's really satisfying and fun to embody that, um, especially when you start going up against the Romans, because they're, they have these very well-drilled, tight blocks of infantry. And of course, the Huns have just these magnificent cavalry units, who, these uh, astonishing horse archers who are incredibly quick and can just run out of the forest, fire arrows, then just be gone, and you know, just fighting the Romans as that army when you're more powerful than them and you've, you've got more resources is just so satisfying <laughs> uh, and it's it's just fun to fuck up the Romans <laughs> basically <laughs> like uh, and in that way it is, it, it is kind of brilliant hmm. it sounds like it covers the same um, uh, period as At the Gates the thing John Schaefer is making oh yeah the Civ 5 designer because um, that's also Fall of the Roman Empire at the hands of the Barbarians and that you are Barbarians um, whether you like it or not, you're just like a tribe of barbarians, and it's got a kind of like the Romans are, are like an NPC faction, and they're massively more powerful than you at the, at the start. But then, the longer the game goes on, the more they are whittled down by all these barbarian factions at their gates. And there's a kind of tipping point, and it's meant to kind of incentivize all of you, all of the rival barbarian factions, to kind of. Um, uh, the one who conquers the Roman Empire is going to obviously be in a pretty good position, but the one who attacks the Roman Empire too soon before they're weak enough is going to be uh, annihilated. Yes. So you're always like, I want to <laughs> invade Rome. <laughs> Attila's great for that because um, there's actually an objective as the Huns to, um, like a, a bonus objective, an optional one, where you can ally with the um, Western Roman Empire. And it says, oh, if you form an alliance with them, we'll give you, you'll get 2,000 gold. And it's actually a really good thing to do, because they're, they're very rich. <laughs> They've got <laughs> loads of money. Uh, so if you actually, like, and also historically, they sometimes did hire hun- uh, hunts to help defend them. Um, so there's a whole different approach you could take to that historical period where the Huns side with the Romans and kill all the other barbarians <laughs> and assassins. Um, and in that sense, they've actually resolved one of the core problems with the total war format which uh, there's always this anxiety between the sandbox element of Total War and the historical mm-hmm. element, you know, like yeah. how, to what extent do you follow what actually happened, to what extent do you restrict the player from doing anything too insane. Um, and because they've the storyline is this kind of uh, series of apocalyptic portents that's almost outside of your activity, they've actually uh, maintained a sense that you're in, acting out that period, but also giving you the freedom to just do completely different things if you really want to, <laughs> which is really successful. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. The only thing I'd say is I'm not sure why you'd pay £30 for it if you have Rome 2. And Rome 2 is just feels like a richer and bigger, uh, more beautiful and sunny and uh, exciting thing to me <laughs> than Attila. Oh, really? So it's almost, uh, especially because they released the Emperor Edition, which is basically the, the totally fixed version of it, where they've like, got rid of loads of the bugs and given it a graphical update, and it runs a lot better. And that, that was released like only about, I don't know, five or six months ago. Um hmm. So I honestly, if you gave it to me, I'd say just buy that instead of Attila. 
which is a shame, so they're always cursed by the proximity to their own, their own released. The other thing sounds good to me because for listening to um, the Hardcore History podcast, mm. um, and someone recommended just that podcast in general, and I was looking through its recent episodes and figuring out what thing I should listen to to get into it, and he'd just done a, this guy called Dan Carlin, um, and he just talks, just basically talks you through a period of history, but he's an amazing storyteller. Okay. Um, and he'd just done like a five-part series uh, called The Wrath of Khans, and it's um, <laughs> the story of Genghis Khan and um, the Mongols. And that's a fucking amazing story. And oh, it's God, basically yeah. sounds like the same dichotomy um, with well, them and their enemies that um, Attila and the Romans had, where, like, dudes on horses, pretty fucking good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the Mongols uh, were not only fucking amazing on horses, they're like, you know, expert at archers and um, expert uh, horsemen and also expert horsemen archers. And would do things like time their arrow shots for the moment in the horse's gait when all of his feet are off the ground so that they're not being jogged by it. And still shoot birds out of the air in flight. <laughs> yes. And uh, because they lived on, like, just plains with no uh, no kind of farmable land, um, they just ate horses. <laughs> so they're like, their army was... Uh, dudes on horses, but each man had like five horses because the horses were also what they were eating and they would, you know, when they were tired out, they'd switch in new horses and stuff. So they were like, you know, only a fifth of the army was humans. (laughs) Mostly horse faction. (laughs) That's a a brilliant game, uh, like, resource for a game mechanic, isn't it? That you're, you're, the thing that makes you Militarily powerful is also the thing that keeps you alive mm. in these places. Yeah, it, it just meant they had no supply lines, so they, they couldn't cut them off because they were just self-sufficient, basically. Yeah, which is why and they, they could, yeah, pillaged whole... and destroyed everything yeah. around them. <laughs> and the thing that, like, all of their... So all their supplies were moving with them, and they were moving at the speed of horse, which at that period, and for a thousand years before and a thousand years after, was the, the fastest, fastest thing <laughs> in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can move faster than a horse. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I, I always like the, um, the Total War games for that that thing you mentioned about being able to kind of depart from history and do the kind of what mm-hmm. ifs. And having listened now for about I don't know eight hours of Dan Carlin <laughs> talking at me about Mongols, I really want to hear the what ifs because like there's just so many pivotal things that would completely change the globe mm-hmm. entirely. Like they killed between it's estimated between something like twenty and eighty million people, um, oh. and you know they they wiped out pretty much Russia. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they pushed all the way into France on one of their expeditions. And, uh, like, they, the only reason that they didn't conquer in the entire of Europe to the Atlantic and possibly Britain as well is because some guy feigned having gout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, like, a succession squabble. It's because Genghis Khan died, <laughs> and he'd set it up really well for his sons to take mm. over. He was, like, one of the few rulers who made sure that when he was dead... Um, there would be... Everyone knew who his successor would be. It wouldn't be decided by birthright or anything. He'd decide, logically, who was the best man for the job and have all of his sons agree. Mm-hmm. Like, they were, all, they were all on board. Like, yep, that, that son should be the one to rule. Right. And so when he did, they were okay with it. Um, but then it was when he died, wasn't it? The, the, uh, yeah, I think it's so. Yes. I think the so. son died pretty... Not that long after, because he was a massive drinker. Mm-hmm. Nah. And then when they were trying to decide how to replace him, one of the guys, the likely candidate to replace him... Uh, was a rival of one of the other people who had to be there at the meeting, and they have to have a big meeting mm. to decide. And so that guy just called in sick to the meeting for, like, five years. <laughs> and this prevented them from... And so the whole anything. empire was invading. completely paralysed, they couldn't <laughs> conquer Europe, they just collapsed. Oh, <laughs> like, like, normally, like, uh, don't empires resolve this by just killing, like, there's another group who just comes in and kills the indecisive ones and takes, <laughs> them, takes over. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a sort of weirdly, like, uh, like, utterly ruthless to their enemies, but sort of weirdly democratic in some ways almost mm. like they were just very logical and and the key families seem to be just to have unassailable respect so even when this guy was clearly fucking them around mm. you know they were probably going to kill him if he showed up <laughs> but <laughs> well, they weren't going to hold the meeting without him which is, which is why he didn't want to show up but after yeah. a while he was like nah, I don't think I'm <laughs> going to be the flavour of the month <laughs> one of the it would be really interesting I haven't played the Total War games so I don't know how like how much this plays into it but one of the key factors in what determines who wins those fights is information. Because one of the biggest differences mm. between war then and war now is that nobody fucking knows anything. Mm. Like, you know, 
most people died to the Mongols because they didn't believe the Mongols were very powerful. Even though they, after they killed the first 80 million people, the like, <laughs> Russian city was like, ah, I'm sure we could take them. We have fought people on horses before. It'll be fine. And they just get utterly killed. And then the Mongols, you know, killed every last person. So the next town didn't hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, horsemen. I think we'd take them. Hmm. Uh, but also, like, even on the battlefield, they, if people start to panic, I mean, that is, I know, in the, a big factor in total war. Yeah. Um, they couldn't sort of coordinate. You know, if it seemed like some of your friends are running, you just kind of run as yeah. well. Whereas the Mongols, if you ran and the rest of your unit of 10 didn't, they killed you on the spot. <laughs> and if your unit of 10 ran, but the rest of your unit of 100 didn't, then the unit of 100 would kill all of your people. <laughs> and so they were just like, they had to all do the same thing all at once. And so they were like one of the only disciplined factions who were actually, you know, all doing the same thing at the same time. At least according to this podcast, which I'm taking as total gospel from <laughs> any, any sources. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's other stuff about kind of the, you just, the, the significance of them in that they would, after they sallied into Europe and, and basically duffed up Russia and, mm. uh, and killed and burnt and, but then retreated to their, their homelands, then they, they, um, they decimated the Islamic world completely and, uh, and also destroyed China. <laughs> and, uh, and, you th- and Dan Carlin makes the case that if they had turned their attention to Europe, or if they hadn't, in fact, well, that they left a power vacuum, essentially, that the, the Europe was then able to fill. Mm. And if the Islamic world and China hadn't been so destroyed, then Europe would have remained the, the third best power in the world for a long time. And mm. it was possibly only because China and the Islamic world are taken out of the picture by the Mongols. We rose to prominence. Yeah, that we can seek the new world and all this other mm, stuff. You know, and, yeah. That's why games about history are fucking awesome. Yeah. And there should be more of them. Should we do questions from questions? Yeah. Let's do it. Dear CNC, writes Rob, first off, just want to say that I'm so jazzed <laughs> to have a PC-focused podcast. Perhaps there are others... No, there isn't. Nah, I don't think so. Nah. <laughs> but yours is totes faves. <laughs> awesome. Also, you guys have top-notch show notes. Quite right. I enjoy starting my weekend with some insightful game criticism and some random silliness. Now I appreciate a healthy dose of randomness in my podcast, but when it comes to my games, I'm considering a zero-tolerance policy. Recently, I've been playing through Wasteland 2, and every time I try to go through a box, safe, minefield, or brick wall, I face a random number generator, which will grant me success as long as I'm persistent and reload enough times. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but given the slightest chance, I will run repeated trials until I get what I want. But I'm not happy about it. There's a lot of randomness in this game. Random encounters in the waste, weapon damage, hit, chance, crit, chance, loot. However... Some skill checks are fixed, such as dialogue options granted by skills. Why can't other skills operate on this level? Why do developers use random chance as a mechanic? Perhaps the problem is that the game tells me what the chances are. I mean, aren't computer games great because they do all the math under the hood and you don't have to roll a damn die? Thanks, Rob. In pre-Wasteland Los Angeles. (laughs) And he says, P.S. I should probably say I'm enjoying Wasteland 2 very much. I think it's because... If you have hard and fast rules, like if you have the skill then it always works, or if you try this then it will never work, then either things become trivial or the player can get totally stuck and there's literally no way for them to get past it. Whereas if it's a random chance, then even if it fucks you and actually ends your whole playthrough, you're still like, well, it could have gone right. (laughs) You know, the game didn't totally block me off from any chance of success. And I also think it's kind of like, it's got an inherent drama to it, like things can go wrong and right and when it does tell you the percentage chance, that tells you something about what happened. Like, um, you know, if you have, like, a 15% chance to make a shot in XCOM and it works, yeah. you're like, fucking yes! Mm. I don't think Whereas it should if be it didn't tell you that chance, it would just be like, mm. mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> the thing he says about, I have not played Wasteland 2, but if you can just do the same thing again and again until you succeed, that seems to kind of be pointless. Yeah, yeah. that isn't... I don't know if he's talking about... Is he, like, reloading, or...? Uh, well, I'm assuming what he's talking about there is trying to open a box or a safe or or do something with a minefield or a brick wall. Um, and the way it works in, like, if you don't want to play the mini game in Oblivion, you can, like, do a, oh, yeah. an mm. automated attempt and it's got a random chance, but each time you fail, you're using a lockpick. I don't know if Wasteland or something like that, but if you literally mm. use nothing and you can just keep clicking try again until it works, then that's done. <laughs> a lot of uh, random chances used to... Communicate 
how many skills you have, like your effectiveness at something. So you, you control the percentage roll by investing in skills in RPGs yeah. to reduce or increase the likelihood of a thing happening. But not... it's really like there's such a fine line between that feeling satisfying, and I, I think it almost never is because like <laughs> the uh, the percentage chance, like uh, taking a skill to increase my crit chance by two percent, is just meaningless in terms of uh, decision to you know response in Diablo or in something mm. else. And so many choices in RPGs, uh, so many choices in percentage chance systems are about these tiny tweaks to percentages yeah. that you can never really see. Yeah, you'll field. never spot it. Mm. In fact, like even something that takes you from like you know ten percent to thirty percent chance or something, you would actually need to do it. Thousands of times before you can conclusively conclude the difference <laughs> yeah. that had been made. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, XCOM uses it brilliantly because it uh, introduces enough room for surprise or for unexpected circumstance that you have to adapt to. So yeah. if the guy who you has like a 75% chance of blowing a guy's head off doesn't that round and he kills one of your teammates, the enemy kills one of your teammates as a result, that's suddenly like a thing you have to deal with that mm. could have happened. Like it feels reasonable. It also exposes just enough of the system to let you kind of make the decision <laughs> and know that you're kind of how to control it. I know, I know it should feel reasonable, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel so aggrieved <laughs> when I miss an 80% chance to hit shot. Have you ever missed a 99? No, no, I don't think uh, so. I've missed Wait, a 99. I've oh, <laughs> <laughs> been there. And you're a special snowflake. <laughs> There's something about, uh, like in XCOM, it's exciting. It's exciting to roll dice, basically, I think, as well. I think uh, taking chances when it's just a, an all or nothing chance, like shooting someone, mm. there's an element of excitement around that. There, there's an element of anticipation to watch mm. the animation wind up and seeing what's going to happen. I think XCOM exploits that brilliantly. Yeah. There's a, I was thinking about chance recently when I was playing 868 Hack, because it's like lots of things are random in it, but mostly it feels like a sort of very like strict puzzle game. Like, you know, there's very hard and fast rules about if you know where all the enemies are, then you know for sure what the outcome of your move will be. It'll be, if you move here, you will get hit by that guy on the left, but you won't get hit by the guy in front. Um, and instead of, like, the way, you, like, the older school roguelikes work is that um, when you encounter an enemy, you kind of nudge them to do an attack, and they do an attack back, and often they have a chance to hit and a chance to miss. And so you, if you die, it's by attrition and bad luck and um, taking on too many things. Whereas it's like, it's like if you can attack them, they can't attack back. You will always win. You can keep hitting them again and again until they die. The only thing is, the longer it takes you to kill them, the longer you're stuck in one's place only attacking them. And if someone attacks you from another side, then you take damage. Mm-hmm. And you don't take three points of damage anyway. Um, so it's very strict and rigid. But there are, obviously, like, there's level layout and stuff. That's totally random. It's beyond your control. But then there's stuff like, there's an ability called um, Poly, and it just randomizes the types of all the enemies. And it doesn't sound that great at first, because it doesn't give you, like, an inherent advantage necessarily. It doesn't make them weaker enemies. It just changes them. You know, it could change them all to be worse enemies, potentially. But the way you play that game is most of the time you're maneuvering in ways where you can control what's going to happen, and the enemy configurations aren't screwing you. Most of the time the enemies aren't screwing you. It's like, okay, that guy can't get me because he can't go through walls, and, you know, that guy is really fast, but he's far away. Um... And then every now and then you get in a situation where you're like, oh, fuck. You know, there's no way for me to get away from these two guys. Uh, so, And whatever I do, one of them's going to hit me, even if I kill one of them. And if you use poly, then, it's amazing how often that solves it. Because <laughs> it's almost always the reason you're fucked is because of one of their special abilities. Like, I'm safe in here, except there's a glitch. And the glitches can go through walls, and so I'm not safe. And if you just randomize it, very unlikely the glitch will be the same enemy. So it doesn't matter what he is then. If he's ultra tough, who cares? He can't get through the wall. If he's ultra fast, who cares? He can't get through the wall. Um, and so it's like a thing that feels like it's going to be a random chance, and it is, but the chances of it doing something good are actually really high, like unexpectedly high, and it's really interesting. to like Sometimes it creates a new problem, but usually it's not as bad a problem as the one you had in the first place. Haphaz writes in... Is it Haphaz? I assume it's short for Haphazard. We've had this discussion hmm. before. Anyway, sorry... Um, dear Crowbar Bar Black Sheep, thanks to Tom F's entertaining and engaging game maker tutorials, I've been able to make a game prototype, which is now proudly posted on the forums. Have any of the other Crate and Crowbar crew been tempted into giving game programming a go? If so, at what stage do you declare success, failure, or your attention wanders off? Thanks, Haphaz. Or possibly Haphaz. But I like to think <laughs> Haphaz. Yeah, I haven't mentioned that before. I'm doing a tutorial for Game Maker, if you want to learn Game Maker. I'm doing a tutorial for it. <laughs> Look at that, and you'll know. <laughs> Where can you find that, Tom? 
um, on my YouTube channel, which we'll link in the show notes. Yeah. Is that just slash pentatact or something? Yeah, or it's just slash pentatact. Oh, um, and it's not, it's aimed at total beginners and it's only like 15 episodes and about half an hour each. So it's not a huge amount of stuff to get through. Mm. Um, and yeah, try and explain everything for people who don't know how to code and stuff. Have either of you attempted such yeah, things? Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked at Game Maker a long time ago, then didn't realise, nah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was, I was tempted to go and use your, your tutorial series. I will do that, but, uh, February has been quite a busy month for me, mm. so. Mm. I think, um, I wish I kind of had a grounding in it that, you know, I wish I was coming to it at age six. Yeah. And, kind of had, <laughs> you know, uh, I like, I really wish it was taught in schools uh, when, I mean, it might be soon, so as far as I know, but uh, when I was growing up, it, we were learning how to do mail merge and <laughs> yeah. Excel spreadsheets. Yep. And, uh, yeah, learning to actually program and make pro- make those programs would have been a much, much better use of my... My class was just business. rearranging the keys and the keyboards to say, Mr. Cotton smells of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in an IT class... Um, playing like an annoying buzzing sound through my speaker and then as the teacher walked around to try and figure out where it was coming from I would dynamically vary the volume so that it would get oh quieter as, <laughs> as it got closer to me so it couldn't tell it oh brilliant <laughs> the uh, IT know. was taught by the PE teachers in our school oh. for some reason. it was considered like a sort of skillless thing so yeah. it didn't really matter who did it it would be a teacher who yeah. A BT teacher and a biology teacher who did it. Well, biology <laughs> teacher knew loads, actually. But, I, uh, I was taught history. I was taught the French Revolution by uh, the guy I also taught was rugby. <laughs> disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, fucking disastrous, I believe. <laughs> Still angry about it. Um, anyway, yes, uh, I've, I've tried programming. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back into it now. I've got like an idea for a prototype that I want to do. And maybe I think prototyping lots of things quickly and fucking up without any there being any consequences or like having a grand vision for a thing might be a more healthy <laughs> way to approach it than... Yeah, definitely, like, small scope things are really good. Starting to feel like, um, maybe after Heat Signature, my next thing won't be as big scope as Heat Signature. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, there's just a lot of moving parts to this. <laughs> it causes problems with everything. Um, I went to, um, uh, give a talk at a tech camp for kids. It's like a thing you can send your kids to in the holidays to learn more if they, you want to get them into, like, an IT or, like, a, a, tech career and this was a I I was told it was just like a class full of kids who were just at this that's all I knew basically they were at this tech camp and they like their parents sent them there to you know get more into um uh, possible tech careers. Um and so I was there to tell them like what like here's how you can just make a game by yourself and um here's how that could be a career. And uh, I thought well the best way to do this is like show them how you make a game. So I actually kind of made like a very brief thing about ba- like balls bouncing around uh, just talking through the basics of it then I found out after I'd given that talk these like sort of 12 year old kids um, that they had all already made games themselves <laughs> in a thing called Game Salad which is like like Game Maker's drag and drop thing basically so you don't write code but you sort of you organise events and stuff um, and uh, most of them are using Minecraft assets in some way. <laughs> Not because they've been told to, like, they're just, that's, all of them play Minecraft, so that's, like, the first thing. It's, oh, this is going to be a platform about a creeper who shoots guns. Um, but one girl is basically making brothers. <laughs> She's making, like, a game where you have two right. protagonists and you control them both at the same time with, like... Huh. <laughs> yeah, I do, uh, I mean, I, I don't uh, stay away from this stuff out of any derision for it. It's just... Uh... I, I feel there's a limited time on earth. I like, probably, <laughs> probably try and yeah. be good at the things I'm already good at. But at the same time, I can kind of feel like the the wave of my own irrelevancy crashing <laughs> down upon me. <laughs> like it's already it's already starting to happen, and particularly in gaming, where like I mean, eight six eight hack is perhaps a bit too niche for this to be a proper example. But certainly, um, the game that um, followed on from Bastion, I forget what it's called, uh, Transistor. Transistor. So there's there's a bunch of games that are coming out that use like, just the the language of coding. Like Quadrilateral Cowboy. Yeah, and all these other things. And that's, loads of that's, things. that's just not something I'm in tune with. And when, I, like you you're saying earlier, how neat the, the kind of the, the language and the effect of 868 hack is where you have, you know, glitch and debug, that's like a pun in French for me. <laughs> that's a pun in a language I don't understand. And I can see that this stuff is beginning to take hold 
At least in the in the circles that I move in, and it's only going to spread. <laughs> and at some point, I'm just not going to understand the world anymore. <laughs> Hack and slash. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. The more I think about it, the more it is. I mean, by fucking nerds. That's what <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't conclude too much about the general populace from this. I think it's mostly no. But I mean, the you know, programmers are making the, the the people who create the kind of culture. If they have particular interests, then they are also the people who broadcast. That yeah, culture will. To us. I'm sure it'll encourage people to get into that stuff. I, I, hope, I hope it does. I, I do hope it proliferates. I just hope I'm, I'm not de- declared as irrelevant by the singularity and <laughs> you know, shuffled into a pit somewhere and burnt. I think as long as you can always draw a good cock, then uh, your services will be in the People will always I, need a good cock. God, thank <laughs> God for that. Uh, Mental Penguin writes in to say, Heart of Thorns. What is Heart of Thorns, Tom? It's the first expansion to Guild Wars 2. He says Heart of Thorns. Has it persuaded any of you to get back into GW2, which is obviously Guild Wars 2, to start playing it? To give up entirely? Favourite bits? What's the most cataclysmic event you've caused in a game? He goes on to write in a separate tweet. <laughs> Best adaptation of a board game into a video game? And vice versa? He says, really hedging Whoa. his bets on the number of questions he can get to the podcast. Um, so should we... Uh, I'll, thoughts? You I'll, I'll take the first one. Uh, yeah, because it, it exactly uh, did encourage me to go back to Guild Wars 2, and I've got like a, a um, level cap, level 80, little tiny uh, dog mongrel creature necromancer uh, <laughs> in Guild Wars 2. And uh, Guild Wars 2 is fucking brilliant. It really <laughs> is the best ever mode. Like, I've started playing Final Fantasy XIV for bizarre reasons earlier in this year, and then, like, I spent £20 on the, on Final Fantasy and then just played Guild Wars 2. It's like, what am I doing? What am I doing in that other game? I'm just <laughs> just gonna play this. It's like it's just more beautiful. Uh, it's more kind of generous. Um, like it's an MMO where you can just spend an hour in it, and it's very happy for you to do do that. There's no subscription fee. It's uh, it's also ah oh, man, it's so good. Do you uh, play with other people? Uh, not really much at all actually. Like I've soloed almost the the entire story. <laughs> uh, just oh. uh, just to see new places in that in yeah, that world because yeah. it's all about kind of. It's all about ambient adventure. So you just about wandering through a space and getting pulled into things. It's about being yeah. constantly distracted. Instead of picking up a load of quests and then ticking them off as you go around, it's about just kind of moseying along and seeing things and then going, Oh, there's a jumping puzzle there and it looks like there's something at the top of that mountain, I'll go get it. Mm. And then and then oh there's a big fucking dragon there and the like literally seventy people fighting it, I'll join in there. And none of this stuff is really gated from you. Like there's no sense that because I'm level 20, I can't do cool shit like fight big dragons. Yeah. Uh, and it, it really fixes so so much, so much of the kind of elitism that's built into MMO design where you're only allowed to have the real fun. It is true of Destiny through to you know early World of Warcraft where you're only allowed to have the real fun, the real game, when you've put 100 hours into it. Yeah. And Good Wars 2 rejects that completely and says, look, just go and see cool things and do cool things. Do you have any sense of, A, how well Guild Wars 2 did, and B, w- whether this will actually create new sales for them? Um, I, I hope so. It's hard to tell, because um, they have like a, an in-game microtransaction store, but it's for like purely cosmetic stuff. Mm. And it's, but it's still incredibly populated. Like, going back into oh, right, it, like okay. it's absolutely bustling. I was posting pictures on Twitter of like insane high-level characters, where there's this enormous kind of... Uh, the kind of guy with a twirly moustache he's like a giant he's got two mates with mirror balls on the end <laughs> kind of beaming like laser disco beams all, all around the place and he was just he was just standing in the, the like a population centre just to go look at my mirror balls <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah there's, there's still loads of people in it I mean I'd, um, I really hope it's been a success um, for Arena Nets and they're obviously still supporting it and I think there are probably loads of lapsed players who have gone to the end of the story who will be brought back by hmm. an expansion I have really fond memories of it. I didn't. I'd like to know how much I played it. I can't remember. Like I don't know if I saw like a play played count or anything, because it's hard to judge. Like I think I feel like I saw a lot of places, but I also when I think about my character, I almost can't remember what it was. <laughs> I had two. I had like a, a human female warrior and a, is it Silvari the tree people? Yeah. Um, one of those was a rogue, um, called Special Branch. Uh, Uh, and i really liked the the weapon thing like how each class you can use like all the weapons you can use will give you different skills yeah and i think i I ended up with like a dagger and a torch and i would do stuff like i could throw the torch at people and set them alight and then when they came towards me burning i could backflip away from them and stab them at the same time and stuff like that and finding those combinations really satisfying 
And I love the Savari, like, place. <laughs> yeah, like, they have like a city and then yeah a bunch of quests around there and like the they have some, some like way of depicting leafiness that's really convincing to me <laughs> so I still like have very vivid memories of that <laughs> um, and also like in terms of like the moment to moment stuff I, the combat I liked but I was mostly sort of interested in like finding interesting combinations and then once I found those um, I wasn't finding it so inherently pleasurable that I was going to do that forever I was you know wanted to move on to the next thing um, but one system that worked well for like keeping me playing, I don't know if it's a positive or negative really, but, um, the fact that, um, I can't remember exactly how it works, but like every time I logged in, it would give me a reward for finding like five resource nodes or whatever and, or mm-hmm. chopping down five trees and mining five things and, um, uh, like for every activity, if you were encouraged to just do a little bit of it, I think it's every hour or something. As you, and if you do that, you get a special reward. And um, I think those are the daily quests. It gives you a list of things, and if you do three yeah, or five, it's not presented goes. like a quest. Like if I gone to an NPC and he said, "Go and find five bits of wood," I'd be like, "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But because it was just an inherent ambient thing, like yeah. it, should you come across five saplings, then um, which you always do, of course, yeah. because you're, you're traveling through the world. Yeah, that's that's kind of how it operates. It stops that dumbass cycle of going back to town and then going back out into the world and so you actually get to travel and um, the locations are extraordinary like there's this eastern area where um, like it's, it's desolated and there's a huge scar going through the middle of it for this like purple um, miasma around it and that's where like a, a huge dragon crashed through <laughs> that zone um, and if you like once every I don't know 36 hours if you are at the right place the dragon fucking comes back <laughs> and then like you know when it's going to happen because uh, there are like 150 people there. <laughs> like they're like, oh, this uh, this event's about to tick off, guys. Okay, well, and the, everyone's on like global chat, going, you know, dragons about to spawn, dragons about to spawn, and uh, it's a, a, a really funny kind of conflict between the story of the area, which is really <laughs> epic, and the kind of uh, casual gaminess of people's chat around it, and the kind of, you know, uh, but you still get like a big epic, stupid fight with this ludicrous big dragon. The the, the trouble with a lot of the group events is there's no real tactical, like. Uh, significance of what you do in them you're just a part of the Zerg the Zerg horde and you just sort of mob the thing and mash your buttons and there's no like just there's, there's some kind of like I mean it's, it's not just about doing DPS there's there's like a agility kind of mini games and right you have to kind of get out of the attack pattern oh, yeah. of, of the, the dragon's fire and stuff like that which I can I can see why that's entertaining to do multiple times, whereas mm. I think if you just sat there all putting your DPS hits on something until it goes bloop and turns into a treasure <laughs> chest, yeah. then that would be boring. But I think uh, there is that it does do that. It does have the abilities where it kind of puts templates on the ground. You have to mm. uh, you, you, there's a, a dodge move in it, which is really important. Where you just double tap the move, and if you're a tiny little pug necromancer, you flip miles, <laughs> uh, sort of sort of miles away from it. And that, that's really nice. I think most of that stuff is spectacle more than anything. Sorry. Right. But the, uh, apparently the dungeons are quite uh, involved, and I've not really done many of that, much of that stuff. So that's what I'll be doing when I play uh, a Heart of Force expansion. Mm. Good video game. Uh, do you have anything to say about the most cataclysmic event you've caused in the game? Oh, yeah. Well, I destroyed Europe. <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah. I was, when I was playing as Europe in DEF CON. There's nothing to the Mongols. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't do that. <laughs> well, a few things didn't do that. Uh, I played in diplomacy mode, um, which is where you all start allied, but um, you can betray anyone at any time, and so it's about like scheming behind people's backs. But I was mm-hmm. playing against the AI <laughs> to see what they do, and they never betray. So eventually I got bored, and I had to betray, and of course, I... <laughs> I was attacked by every single country in the world, fired all of their nukes ever mm-hmm. at Europe. And so Europe had 100% coverage of nuclear <laughs> death. Um, but also, uh, in my second Galaxy of Diary, um, I think I destroy like 85 suns. <laughs> yeah. So that's right. more, I would say. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably, probably worse than Europe. <laughs> that's going to win, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really. I can't really top that. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's funny how like how trivial scale is in video games because like I always think of DefCon when people ask we had questions before about like how what's the most people you've killed or like oh. um, things like that. And yeah, DefCon always comes up with anything. Oh no, wait! I, I destroyed those suns as well, <laughs> <laughs> and that destroyed whole solar system. Just, 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 I mean, Earth was one of the planets I destroyed. <laughs> like, we, I destroyed Sol, and that the, the supernova destroys all of the planets in the solar system as well, as mm. it would. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this this planet, I'm afraid, did not make it. <laughs> Callous, cold-hearted killer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of it's such a moot 
point to like, you know, you think it's silly that you can uh, do these terribly destructive things and have no emotional connection to them. But how could you ever really like? Even just taking one life is impossible mm. to really make the player. Well, that's not the problem with video like games. That. There's a problem with human empathy. <laughs> yes, it's repeated across centuries and centuries of human endeavor. I uh, uh, last week at Paradox um, was playing a game where I uh, playing as Nazi Germany took Poland and uh, Austria and Lithuania um, primarily because I. Uh, research really advanced night vision for Nazis <laughs> and uh, among other things. And Good job. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I didn't feel... I felt satisfied and bad at the same time. <laughs> Very conflicted about those games, really. There's a great line yeah, in strange, um, Peep Show. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's an RTS he plays, which I think is... You play, exclusively play as the Germans. Um, mm. and it's cool now. Yeah, Mark Hogan. Um, yeah, he's... Um, it's one of the few things that is not remotely about gaming but when they do mention gaming it's entirely accurate yes, and really insightful yeah. Peep Show um, the TV series yeah right okay and Mark Corrigan uh, I think he's being interrupted or something playing it and he's like ah, give me a minute I've got to win this for the Fuhrer <laughs> 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 like that weird sense of obligation that games give you where it's like achieving this thing is obviously worthwhile because you're being asked to do it and then when you think about it I am just winning this for the Nazis aren't I <laughs> It's a great right after that as well, and it's like focusing on just clicking, and he's like, I don't really know why I'm doing this anymore. It's, it just has to be finished, and I have to, I have to be gone with my life. Uh, and that's also completely accurate for a lot of games, <laughs> yeah. where, like, especially in RTSs, where there's this clean up phase. Yeah. Like you've got to, fuck you gotta it finish it. You can't leave it yeah, on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and finally, Mental Penguin's other question. Uh, best adaptation of board game to a video game, and vice versa? Do you think that's happened? Ooh. And vice versa, interesting. That's a good question. I helped design the um, uh, Sir You're Being Hunted board game. Oh, awesome. I have no idea if that was ever printed or sold. Oh. <laughs> Did you ever play it? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I played it with Jim when we were designing it. <laughs> it good? Which is better out of the board game and the, the full game? Ah, uh, the full game. <laughs> <laughs> um, board game to video game. Does I can only think of um, the only one where I've played both would be, I think, Dragon Commander. <laughs> The, um, oh, really? the Larry and Studios game, yeah, right. um, because I was on a you know preview trip to play it, and so I played it. I played the game there, um, and then also they were working on the board game at the time, and so they we played a prototype version of that in the evening, hmm. and so I have played both of those. I think the board game was quite promising actually. It was quite simple, um, like simple but not a thing I'd played before, um, which might just be my board game ignorance. Uh, but on that basis. Maybe the board game of that is better. <laughs> hmm. I really want to play the XCOM board game. I've not played it yet, but there is one, I think. Oh, yeah? I think so. How's that work? I don't know. Turn based aliens, shoot these. Oh, nice, probably. <laughs> probably isn't But some, somebody takes. It's like a two player game, one person plays the aliens, one person plays the humans, is what I mean. I'd, I'd assume, but I don't, yeah. I don't know. I just know that it's out there and people like it. Hmm. I think the, the games, the board games are like most have a social element, which is quite difficult to kind of capture mm. in a in a video game. Yeah, I'm always like most of the uh, our board game regulars involve lying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like some of you are secretly something, and you've got to lie about being that thing. And there are very few games that really involve that. Uh, video games, I mean. Mm. Twilight Struggle should be the video game, and it's quite possible that it is going to be a video game. I can't remember if it's in development or not, but uh, it was designed by the create um, one of the lead designers of Enemy Within, which was the expansion to mm. XCOM Enemy Unknown, and has like annual tournaments. Is that the so one that's um, it's like the highest rated board game ever? It's yeah, <laughs> basically it is. Yeah, it's it, like mm. it, it's um, uh, one versus one uh, game about the Cold War. Yeah, and it's asymmetrical because it's really asymmetrical. Like there are phases to it where. Like the uh, one faction is really strong in the early game, but really weak in the late game. There's, oh, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> it's, uh, there are also so many fucking tokens that it should be a video game. <laughs> <laughs> like it's kind of a hassle to play. Mm. It's, yeah, like so many. Uh, it's like uh, Sodium Infernum, which is basically a board game in digital form, but you'd never want it to be a board game because there are so many tokens involved. And, <laughs> and um, that guy is making board games. He now, is, right? yeah, which is really interesting. He switched. Vic Davis. Yeah. It didn't sound like a happy thing, did it? It sounded like he was sort of decided he couldn't make computer games anymore. Yeah. Is that something about, like, it just was technically incapable of doing it? Like, 
he seemed to feel that they'd moved on so much that he couldn't keep up. Yeah, that's, that was the tone of the blog post he used to. But I don't know. Explain why. Have they really? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not working in Game niche. Maker, so I'm biased. <laughs> not, not, I don't, not for that niche, I don't think. I think for people who love those games, like he, they can look. Like, they, they always had like a. I don't know. An aesthetic that was suited, suited to the, the yeah. universe he was trying to portray. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but. Like, it, I just think he would make a fucking amazing board game. <laughs> yeah. Like, because all his games are basically just slightly overcomplicated board games. Mm. I'm really excited. JCD Bionic Man. <laughs> <laughs> that is the login details for your computer in DevX. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, my God. Either it's deja vu or he has written it before and you said exactly the same thing. Uh, <laughs> that is the kind of information I just recite on, yeah. on Rote. <laughs> Well, you have a few beers in you, you know, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, I he, can't, if I know that, I can't not say it. <laughs> Deus Ex, come on. He asks, is the arena shooter dead? And then answers his own question. <laughs> if so, what's with all these new ones showing up? <laughs> and what does the future hold for Quake Live? There are loads of new yeah, arena shooters, particularly on early access. There's loads of good ones. Uh, there's yeah. one called Toxic, which looks fucking great and I still haven't uh, played it even though Marshall should, should play Reflex ah uh, yeah, yeah that looks oh, really nice fucking brilliant it's just uh, that looks just exactly like Quake 3 uh, it is and it's uh, whereas it was like Toxic is Unreal Tournament 2K4 and okay. uh, that is Quake 3 basically yeah and I'm totally cool with that also like I, I played the prototype which is um, uh, looks just like it's quite slick actually but uh, it's all about the feeling of movement the lightning fast completely responsive movement mm. and the speed that you have from those games that the shooter's completely lost uh, and it's it's about time it was uh, you know resurrected en masse I just I, I worry that I'm going to go back to those kind of games which I used to love oh, when great. I was of, of that age mm. I no I'm not going to have anything like the reaction that I did <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to feel like a oh yeah like a, like a, no, no. uh, uh Suffering synapses will not be able to keep mm. up with the uh, pace of the <laughs> But maybe if we, all, if we only ever play with each other. Yeah, that would be fine. And then we'll be on parity forever. That'd be great. But yeah, I don't, I don't think the arena shooter is dead. I think there's lots of games that are, uh, coming out soon which are bringing it right back. I don't I, know about Quake Live though. I, I don't know what the population looks like. But... There's an Unreal Tournament game being made. Yeah, exactly. I don't, yeah. Very publicly. Mm. And the good thing that is too. Yeah, it's good because. Um, the, the FPS has lost mobility in the, when it went into its military phase. Yeah, that's everyone, true. Everyone, everyone They're not about it. movement anymore, are they? No, apart from Titanfall's kind of bringing that back, but I think we'll see more and more of that, like, you know, tribes-esque. Oh, Toxic has this great video, which is just a list of things that it doesn't have in it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> from modern shooters. So there's, you know, there's no fucking upgrade tree, there's mm. no XP, <laughs> none of this stuff. That's uh, a good concept trailer. Yeah, yeah really great. good. I'll play that. And that is all the questions that we have this week and also all the time that we're going to spend this evening talking to you about video games. You can write us questions at questions at createandcrowbar.com You can tweet at us at createandcrowbar and you can tweet or follow us individually. I'm at Pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T I'm at Marsh Davis which is D-A-V-I-E-S I'm at uh, PCG Ludo L-U-D-O Thanks for listening everybody!